Hey guys, welcome back to White Naval Garage. Years ago in this very spot, Mike the Disgruntled Mechanic did a video reviewing a launch tool, and it happens to be his most watched video, so I thought that was pretty cool. But uh, I've got a launch tool now to do a review on. It's taken some years to get this. Um, it's not the Pro, but it's the X431. Um, a little cheaper version for a guy like me doing uh, DIY stuff. And I uh, thought I'd put you through the ringer here, show you all the aspects of it, or as many as I can anyway. I don't uh, have a shop where I get a lot of different cars to work on, but we're going to have some fun learning about the tool. So, let's get started. Alright, first thing you do is get the tools. Open up the case, make sure you got everything, and uh, keep your paperwork. Very important. Uh, piece of information right here. It's got your serial number and the activation code. You'll need those things to get on the internet to activate your uh, VCI. That's your uh, tool part here that goes into your data link port, data link connector. Uh, once you register and get online, create an account, you can then download all the updates and there was quite a few on this. It took probably about 20 minutes to get all the updates. You can select the ones you want. I just hit them all. Um, you do have two years of uh, use out of this tool without doing an update. And I did ask the person I bought this from, um, if you don't want to do an update, you can continue using the tool. It just won't have the newer cars, of course. But uh, So that's a good thing. I like that part already. So that's a few highlights that I've found about it so far. Let's get out to the shop and check this dude out. All right, we're connected to a 98 Chevrolet one-ton truck with a 5.7 liter, just over 200,000 miles. It has not been scanned in a while. It is a federal emissions truck, meaning not to California. So even though I don't have a check engine light on, it doesn't mean we don't have codes. And it is one of the main reasons I like having a scanner around the garage is to keep tabs on the health of an engine or the um, vehicle overall because you know, all I'm doing here is auto search this is my VIN as I'm talking uh, we've got some questions to answer about the vehicle you're hooked up to and we want a health report as I was saying I like having scanners around so I can keep up on my vehicles and address anything here in the shop that I can do before you know conv uh, Conversing with a pro, maybe I can save some money, or at least I can give him some information about what I found. Under 15000 and now it's searching. Huh, there we go. Right off the bat, I've just learned I have three faults in my powertrain system. Of the systems that are available in this truck, everything else passed except for the powertrain that we uh, saw come up. So we want fault report. We have three to look at, and there are the codes. I'm going to write those down for future reference. Now that we've logged, uh, since I'm a student of this, I am logging on paper. Now you can do a report, and you put in your VIN number, owner's name, license, and all that. Okay, that was kind of grayed out, so I didn't think that was highlightable. Is that that word? Highlightable? And it takes you right to the internet. All right, I'm not going to sit here and go through this with you. This is not a diagnostic video. It's about the capabilities of this tool. But I tell you what, it's not good news, but I'm, you know, it's a nice tool to follow along and write to the internet. Now I can get some information about this problem. I'll switch you around a little to <laughs> try to get you out of the glare. This is terrible. Uh, I want to do, um, let's look under read data, engine data. And right there it is. We had O2 data. So now we want to bring up some PIDs, they call them, and possibly go to graph mode, and we'll start the truck and see what happens. All right, our codes had to do with Bank 1 Sensor 2 and Bank 2 Sensor 1. So now that we have those, let's push OK, and we'll get some data. It defaults to the value which gives you a numeric uh, formula. In this case, I think we'd rather see graphical. 
and you can already tell there's a difference between the two sensors this being bank one sensor two and this is bank two sensor one but that's not <laughs> confusing enough kind of cool is you can combine them it gives you a great representation of the differences so let's go back you can also hit one bring that to full screen go back and you can bring up the other one instead so that's nice options yeah, I like that. That's kind of cool to see that. I don't like that my truck has got an issue, but pretty neat that we can see what the tool's capable of. Another thing would be nice to look at since we have O2 circuit problems, our both long-term and short-term fuel trims. So we'll bring those up. All right, again, we have the value. I'd rather see this in geographical. Now you can only get two at a time, but down here you do see one of two, one of one, so you can change those. So here we're looking at long-term bank one, long-term bank two, and this is going to be a learned value from the short term. So let's go to short, or to, uh, yeah, short term, short term one and two, and again, you can see the differences there. So what I've done is save the data save the freeze frame data so I have everything that I need to go back and do in troubleshooting but I did go ahead and delete the codes I started the truck and I'm waiting for it to warm up to go in the closed loop to make sure the pulse stay away but it might have been me setting those codes because I was doing some other work on this truck so that's what I'm hoping for I'd like to see a page that showed when it goes into closed loop, let's go to engine data. There we go, loop status. There's just one. I wonder if that's taking care of all four or not. This is a good representation of when the value as opposed to graphical would look better because you just want to see that it's in closed loop. This is the sensor 2 from bank 1. And it's quite handy actually. We can get to that and test the heater sensor. It's just a matter of an ohms check. If it's open, we know the, the heater sensor in, or the heater circuit within the O2 unit is bad. On Chevrolets, the two brown wires are your heater circuit. In most cases, I think all cars have the same thing. The two colored wires that are the same are your heater circuit. So it's just a matter of getting in the terminals here and uh, reading our ohms, get that set up. All right, I'm satisfied with that. We've got continuity, so the sensor itself is okay. Go somewhere else. Okay, I brought us up a diagram to check this heater circuit. Uh, the two wires I was going after are the connector side or the sensor side I should say, and the two brown wires. On the body side, you have a pink wire that comes from the underfuse hood, which I've, we saw that that was good. Follow the pink wire down, which by the way, they're spliced in, all the pink wires go to all the heaters. And this is the body side, through the actual sensor itself and then the ground. So what we need to do is find the two wires, ground and this pink wire with our uh, test light, make sure it has current, you know, battery voltage, and that it can carry a, a load or carry current. So we're going to hook up to black and pink and see if we got uh, capability of powering that unit. All right, a little confusing. It says under hood fuse block engine one. The closest I can see is ECM one, but I did check all 20 amp fuses and they all are all good. So we should have power down to the O2 sensor. All right, these two top pins are my pink and black. Should be able to carry a load. Man, it's kind of hard to get those both in there without touching anything else. So there's one and there's the other and definitely we're carrying uh, about 1.6 amps there. 
One of the functions we can do with this tool is an active test. We can open and close the loop, and this will uh, make sure that we know the computer's working. I select the close, and we see close, so the computer's doing what it should. Having some bi-directional control is the power of this tool. All right, so I've selected our bank one sensor to the one that we suspect is bad. Now we can read the voltage on the heater circuit. It should be between 100 millivolts and 900 millivolts. Not much of a switching there. Is it? It's 500 to about. Uh, starts off at about 575. We'll call it down to 500. So let's compare that to a known good bank one sensor. A great capability that you can bring the two graphs together and it's real easy to see the differences this is our suspected bad sensor bank one sensor two and this is bank two sensor two and you can see that this one is not switching as uh, well as the known good sensor here's an interesting graph this is just measuring rich lean conditions and I've combined the two you can see now this doesn't look bad when you combine them in this rich lean graph let me back out of you show you what I did there's the two separated and here's the two that I selected it's just another way of uh, looking at the data which is kind of cool and that's it there rich lean bank one rich lean bank two There it is in just the value. You can see it switching back and forth. And then here are the two graphs again if I combine them. That's kind of neat. Now they look perfectly symmetrical. What do you do when all the tests you know to do have checked out? Well, I know that with the four sensors I have, by looking at the part numbers, the two downstream sensors are the same. So what I've done is switch the, the sensors. Restarted the truck. And right now, we're showing no fault codes in the uh, powertrain system. But we need to do some dry cycles on the truck and see if it comes back, because I don't think I fixed it, uh, unless I got real lucky. Bank 1, sensor 2, was our suspect. It is now in Bank 2, sensor 2's position. So look at that green graph there, and now we'll compare it to this one. So our suspected bad sensor is now in this position, the green one. And you can see the difference between this graph, this one. That's 200 millivolts, give them plus or minus. Of course, it's supposed to do that. This one is at 637 millivolts and it's holding pretty steady. So what I'd like to see next is the check engine, or the uh, fault come back, but in the bank two sensor two position. You know the graphs are a little small and it does not auto rotate or anything. You have to read it in this position. But you can just see the difference graphically, the differences in the range. This sensor is almost flatline and this used to be in the bank one position. It is now in bank two position. So just by switching those two sensors, we can see it followed it to the new position. So this is a great indication that we have a bad sensor, even though the heater test circuit and power going to the heater circuit is all intact. The computer also needs valid switching times and mid-max values, and I think that's where the problem lies. We're not getting that. I'm going to finish the video inside because it's just so bright out there you cannot see the screen. But there it is, ladies and gentlemen, the code I was hoping for. It took three days of driving the truck. And I checked it every day, and it finally came up with a code. So I guess I surpassed the drive cycles that GM engineers were looking for, and the computer's not happy. But I am, because now we can 100% verify that the sensor is bad, because the code reflects bank 2, sensor 2 position, and that's exactly where we moved it. So that is it. The truck is fixed, and I can uh, tell you that I'm very happy with this tool. 
The graph mode capabilities gave me a hint that we were on the right track and now with the code uh, that we see here I can 100% verify spending my money and, and actually be happy about it. Thanks for the views, thank you for all your support and uh, leave your comments below. I always like to see who's hanging around. Alright, see you in the next video.